in focus proudly brought to you by IBC Media Development Initiative and Daytech. governance and policies for the next five years. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Bradley Valenaki. Welcome to this one hour special of InFocus, supported by Media Development Initiative through the PNG Australia Partnership. Welcome to the program. Our topic of discussion, good governance and the policies for the next five years. Good governance and good policies uh, are some of the things that have been discussed in this country and we're heading towards the election. It's relevant this time around. My uh, guests uh, joining me on the panel this time around from left to right, uh, Mr. Paul Baca from the INA, and also joining me up on uh, the panel, we have uh, in between um, Emily Matasororo uh, from UPNG, uh, an academic there, uh, and also a longtime journalist as well, and also Russell Yangin, who is an academic also from the University of Papua New Guinea, attached to the politics department. Now, uh, ladies, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay, first things first, um, important in the discussions, two big words. Um, you have good governance, uh, which we always say is a pillar for democracy, and also um, policies. Uh, how do we make policies work? The, Two different words, but they work hand in hand. We'll start off first with uh, Mr. Baka, your comments. Okay. Several years ago, we hosted a, a forum and we looked at the economic uh, issues, political issues, governance issues, and why many of them had had problems in PNG. And at the end of the day, we said, look, governance is fundamental. If you haven't got good governance, then nothing else quite works. You can, if you have poor governance, then your economy won't come together, your politics won't come together. So that concept of basically the rule of law and adherence to the rule of law is fundamental. Um, and, and good governance, accountability, and all associated uh, aspects. So yes, you... You're not going to get the perfect laws, but you want sound laws, and you then apply them and follow them. So basically, your society and your systems function according to those, those basic rules. You want the right policies. You need the right policies. Again, they don't need to be perfect, but what you do need to avoid is chopping and changing the policies constantly. And again, once you have policies, you need to try and adhere to those policies. And there's often uh, a saying in PNG, this is the, the most governed, the most uh, law, so many laws, and the most policies. And yet, so many of them are not actually being applied. So you, need, you don't need to make them perfect, but you need to try and get them in the right direction, refine them over the course of time, don't chop and change them, but actually make good use of them and review them periodically to be able to uh, enhance them. All right. Um, Emily, you have been uh, a journalist for a very long time. Now you're attached to the University of Papua New Guinea as an academic. Over the years, you, you, you've seen uh, you know, uh, governments come and go on um, and policies as well. Um, you're an academic now. Um, your view of, on how things have changed over the years? Well, um, I think um, what we, um, Mr. Baka spoke about um, policies and, you know, how good they can be. Um, what good will they be if um, the people uh, are not receiving the services? And um, I, I think this is where uh, the media plays a very big um, role in conveying uh, the messages, government messages down to the people. And likewise, um, uh, the aspirations of the people to the, to the government of the day. Um, I think um, we don't really enjoy that um, kind of democracy that we used to enjoy uh, decades ago. Um, 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's sad to say that, but, um, you know, it's a two-way thing. It's a two-way thing between uh, our leaders and the people. And I think if messages are not going down to the people, where you know it should rightfully go, go, go uh, there's something wrong somewhere. And we need to project uh, these messages down to the people. And um, so, you know, I think the, the media plays a, a vital role in all of this. I, I, you know, I can, um, I take my hat off to, to our hardworking journalists um, of the day, but um, I, I was, I have to say this, um, I was on Facebook um, yesterday and I, <laughs> I read of um, uh, a family, a, a parent, a mother and father, they lost a, an eight, eight month old um, child somewhere in, um, in a Western province in Nomad and I was really uh, um, sad about what happened, uh, the, the family, uh, carried the child to the hospital and it took them like a whole day to walk there only to uh, you know to arrive at the hospital and the child is dead so you know for me I thought that um, government services are not going down to the people and this this death could have been prevented somehow um, we live in you know the day and age of um, communication and um, technology and everything and still our people uh, back in um, rural, the rural areas are suffering you know big time yeah so um, messages have to be, you know, have to go down to the people somehow. Um, messages, you know, telling our people, informing our people how they should uh, cast their votes, who they should vote for, all these kind of messages. Um, and at the end of the day, it's the people, you know, who are at the receiving end. We, you know, we receive the services that um, we should be. Yeah, so. Um, you know, the messaging part is, I, I believe, is very important as well in uh, these elections. Of course, and it's important in policy that uh, policies we make must reach the people, uh, must translate uh, to the little people uh, who are receiving um, them at the most rural parts of Papua New Guinea. Good governance and, and policies, coming back to the topic good governance and good policies. Good governments make good policies or good policies make good government? Um, what do you tell your students in school when, uh, when you're talking to them? Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> what uh, Mr. Baka has said, um, adherence to the rule of law. Well, that's something in, in, in good governance and good policies. In uh, good governance, uh, where do we start? In, in, in PNG politics, we have a sort of two structure. You have the national level and the local level. Okay, that's, uh, the local level is where the political power is. Now, since independence, we have a lot of good policies and good laws in place. But as uh, Mr. Baker has pointed to, uh, this policy has been uh, chopped, cut, pasted by different governments. Now, consistency is what we want as a nation, okay? Now, when government keeps on changing, that also uh, disturbs the flow of, of implementing most of these policies now. Like, most of these policies might not be perfect, but we have some of the good policies already in place. It's just that um, we have to ensure that these policies, or the idea of good governance is um, understood well within our local context and our lo local people, and it must synchronize well with the national and the local level. So policies will work, and I believe uh, we have Vision 25 is a very good policy document. It will work when the government has a strong political will, and it is also understood well by the people. I think it comes back to the pillars that uh, you know, make, make good governments what they are, and then also good policies as well. All right. This is In Focus. Uh, you're watching the one-hour special for this month, brought to you by MDI, Media for Development Initiative, through the PNG Australia Partnership. We take a breather now and come back on the other side with more of our discussions. You're watching In Focus. Welcome back. The one-hour special edition brought to you by our friends from MDI, Media for Development Initiative, through the PNG Australia Partnership. Our topic of discussions for the panel is good governance and policies for the next five years. 
Now, moving on, we'll take a look at you know, the policies of, of government uh, in this time of parliament, um, and one that's been uh, talked a lot about since uh, Prime Minister James Marpe came into office is Take Back PNG. Uh, and through that sort of uh, umbrella, we've seen the policies um, uh, fall under this. Um, Prime Minister Marape has been talking about uh, giving opportunities back to Papua New Guineans, uh, and some of the policies have been framed towards that. We'll start off with you, Mr. Baka. Um, have we sort of seen that uh, fall in place? Sure, and just before I respond to that, maybe I can just re-emphasize a point that Emily was highlighting in terms of the role of the media in communications, because when it comes to governance, it's so critically important that the public, but also Parliament, uh, is fully aware of, of what the policies, what the budget allocations, and all, all the uh, reforms, etc., actually consist of. So that they're not just words, but what they uh, relate to in terms of project funding, in terms of, uh, of activities, because it's so critical that the public is engaged and is able to hopefully engage in the process of putting together those policies through a, a dialogue process, but also in being aware and then holding the government accountable subsequently. So there are a number of mechanisms, but the, the media plays a critical role as the fourth arm, as they say, of government, the fourth dimension that... Uh, that they, then the public can make a contribution and, uh, and if, if there's abuse of public funds or those policies are not actually being applied on health and education or whatever, then that the public can then thump the table and, uh, and demand accountability and, uh, and performance. But going back to your question on, um, on take back, well, yes, I'm not sure that the wording was necessarily the best wording but the concept that PNG and, and Papua New Guineans should be better in, and more fully engaged in their own economy and, uh, and be getting full benefits from, for example, the resource extraction and re resource utilization, that is absolutely critical. There is a lot of concern that sort of Papua New Guineans are often being observers rather than engaging fully. You see major resource projects where there are large numbers of uh, overseas workers coming in, not just on resource projects, but sometimes on, uh, on major construction projects, where quite clearly the level of skills are available within the local community. Maybe not when you have a big LNG new project um, that has 21,000 people at the peak, Maybe the local number of um, welders and electricians are not available, but many of the skills are available. Maybe they need uh, some further training and, and management, but to try and engage people in the economy and in the workforce, because that's one of the biggest issues in, in this country, is the constant increase in the population, the number of uh, kids going into school, falling out of school because there are not enough places in schools and universities and colleges, but then there are not enough jobs at the end of the day. So trying to generate the extra jobs in both the formal sector, but also the opportunities in the informal uh, economy are absolutely critical because PNG is a resource, a relatively rich country, not just for minerals, but for agriculture and, and across the board. And yet we're not fully taking advantage of those to get participation. Um, Emily, you've spoke about the you know, media coverage. What sort of uh, policies of this government has, has made it to the forefront of, of media coverage constantly uh, in, in this term of parliament? Uh, before I answer that, I, I just want to add on to um, what Mr. Baka has said, uh, talked about um, taking back PNG. I guess um, we all uh, see, or we all um, can interpret um, take back PNG in our own, uh, in our own ways. And um, I think we uh, should be a bit more vigilant, uh, the media fraternity should be a bit more vigilant in the way we um, cover 
in, in our news coverage and report, reporting of these events. Um, there were some uh, coverage, prominent uh, coverage done on um, particular um, politicians that um, I thought uh, received a lot of um, uh, coverage in the papers. The fact that um, uh, we have a high number of uh, uh, illiteracy levels, um, infant mortality rates are you know, right up there, um, it, it just shows that um, probably policies are not working, not you know, working as, you know, as good as they should be. And, uh, you know, um, oh, probably it's the implementation of it that I think you know, should be. So where the media comes in is, um, again, we should be more you know, vigilant towards this kind of, uh, um, especially coming towards elections you know, where national decisions are made. Um, who is going to become the prime minister, the, uh, the, the leader of your, um, your electorate. Have we sort of put in the right mechanisms to monitor the policies and the service delivery uh, mechanisms that we've put in place? Well, I think the, one of the challenging aspects to this question is um, do we have a really a good, vibrant policy and monitoring team across our various departments working? Uh, when we talk about that going into the district level, and that is where we find mm -hmm. challenges, how do we amount and how do we account for huge number of the SIPP, SFP funds going into various projects? Do we have audit teams on the ground? Or are, they, are these audit teams doing their job? And if they're doing their job, then um, are they reporting mechanism from the provinces to the national government? So that's why I've, I've answered earlier that um, it is important that we uh, see where the challenges and issues and where our politics is. Okay, in, uh, our politics is, is basically uh, at the local level. So if we, can, um, if we can start there, so there is this in, in decentralization we we call it the supply and demand perspective of the decentralization argument. So most of the focus is on the supply perspective, and that is where uh, the top-down, where the government comes up with policy and uh, plans and expect the people on the ground to uh, participate and achieve the outcome of that policy. But again, the demand perspective, whether our citizens truly participate, is another question. So in this area, then you can see that uh, when it comes, uh, we have to really define policy and monitoring and evaluation as, as, as taken into account from both perspective from, perspective, from the demand side and the supply side. And more is concentrating on the supply perspective as opposed to uh, the demand perspective. And the demand perspective, I'm referring to uh, the, the civic or the participation of these various programs on the ground. We'll take a short break now on In Focus and come back with more. You're watching In Focus. Welcome back. The one hour special edition brought to you by Media Development Initiative or MDI through the PNG Australia Partnership. Our discussions, of course, uh, today um, I have with me on the panel. Um, again, from left to right, Mr. Paul Baca from the INA, Russell Yangin, and Emily Matasororo from the University of Papua New Guinea, continuing on with our discussion from where we left off. Now, we're talking about good governance and policies for the next five years, but there are real challenges also faced by Papua New Guineans now, um, of course, spillovers from the war in Ukraine, and, and of course, COVID-19 that's still with us, the pandemic. Um, going forward, something for the policy make makers to also take into consideration um, as we head to the elections and, of course, form the next government. There are a whole range of local issues, national issues and international in issues. And, of course, uh, PNG is affected by those international issues as well as local issues. And those international issues include, of course, climate change, which is going to be uh, uh, 
one of the biggest issues is already a major issue, but it's going to be one of the biggest issues that we have to be addressing into the future. There's COVID-19 and the pandemic, but it's potentially one of, uh, of a series of pandemics. We could have further pandemics. So in a way, uh, we have to be prepared, and that's we need a, a strong uh, awareness and uh, deterrence and health service. I think it highlighted that the weaknesses in the health service when the pandemic uh, broke out uh, here and highlighted the need for uh, effective capacity at the national but very much at the local level uh, to be able to and a lot of awareness on on health issues and so that people are prepared and then of course in the global economy you've got uh, the impacts of changing prices so the covid not only had was a health issue, but it was a health and the response with the controls had a big economic uh, impact with commodity prices collapsing and a few prices going up. So gold price rose, oil, copper, and many of the other prices fell as demand fell. And that has implications on the economies and of course economic implications affect people's jobs and uh, and their own welfare and their livelihoods. So, so these things all link up, as do when you have a, a conflict. And we'd hoped, of course, that there wouldn't be another major sort of regional or uh, conflict, but we know that around the world there are various conflicts in Yemen, in Myanmar, and this big one of, of the invasion of, uh, by Russia of its neighbor, Ukraine. Now, that has a big global effect. Now, no war is a good thing because they all have immediate uh, impacts and, uh, and obviously cause unnecessary uh, death and, uh, and destruction, uh, particularly of innocent people because they, they are most affected. But, but it also has the effect that uh, on e economies and commodities. So uh, you've s Russia and Ukraine are both some of the biggest, Russia's one of the biggest oil and gas producers, coal and other commodities. Russia and Ukraine are amongst the biggest producers of wheat, of corn, of rye, and several other important crops, uh, vegetable oils and so on. So the end result has been, as we've seen here, the other end of the world, if you like. Here in PNG, we've seen the, uh, the uh, oil and gas prices shooting up, uh, but we'll also, over the course of time, see the prices of, uh, of food crops growing up. So although, going up, although we're not buying the grain, particularly from those countries, that mostly goes to uh, the Middle East, it has an effect on the global uh, food supply and that, that has repercussions here as well. With the oil price, um, yes, there are winners and losers, of course. PNG is a major net exporter of oil and gas and the, the gold price has also uh, risen again, so we're uh, one of the world's largest gold producers. So there are winners, but of course, as we know, there are also the losers, um, those who are going to be impacted by the general inflation, which started going up anyway, uh, thanks to the lifting of restrictions of COVID and the, the uh, increase in global trade and, and disruption that COVID had caused to the global uh, supply chains. But we're seeing that as the restrictions were lifted, markets uh, opened up again, demand opened up, we saw global prices rising. And then that was uh, reinforced by the effect of the, uh, of the uh, Ukraine invasion and disruption of the oil and, and then those food prices. And as we know, the people who are most affected are the people, the small people who have fixed incomes, the lower incomes and and who have a disproportionate amount of their budget I goes guess, on food. I guess, Mr. Bakar, and many you know, little people will be asking, you know, we are paying for fuel, uh, we're feeling the pinch in our country. How do we solve this through, through government intervention or policy? 
That's really challenging because, as, as you know, we're price takers. So when prices shoot up for something that we're exporting, well, the producers, if, if it's coffee and the coffee prices are good at the moment, the uh, coffee farmers are going to benefit. But uh, if the oil prices rise and you're a consumer of, uh, and everyone's a consumer of oil directly or indirectly because much of the transport is in ships and trucks and buses and so on of goods and of and of people so it works its way through the whole value chain if you get the high prices of transport that works its way through to all the products that need to be transported both domestically and locally so during the early stages of covid for example we did introduce and it was pushed through by the planning department a there was a subsidy on domestic uh, shipping from Leigh to Port Moresby that enabled fresh produce to reach the, uh, the Moresby market more readily and, and more af affordably. It went to one company and it probably should have gone across the board to anyone who was participating. One can provide subsidies like that f on transport and one can actually reduce the, uh, the excise duty on, on uh, fuel to make again the cost of f fuel lower and therefore the uh, cost of transport lower, which again works its way through the whole value chain. Uh, it's not going to be able to affect the international shipping costs because we don't control those, um, but it could affect domestic uh, transport, which can also give a bit of an added advantage or opportunity for um, domestic uh, suppliers and to be able to get through to the market. All right. I think um, Prime Minister James Marape last week announced some interventions there from government to help offset some of, of, of these hardships uh, passed on to the consumers uh, that we're facing right now. You're watching In Focus, our discussions for the one hour special again, good governance and policies for the next five years, brought to you by our friends from MDI, Media Development Initiative, through the PNG Australia Partnership. We'll take a breather and come back on the other side with more. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. Still on our discussions on good governance and policies for the next five years. Look, governments have come and gone. This term of parliament, of course, we've seen two votes of no confidence in this one term of Parliament, which, which has resulted in James Marape being the Prime Minister of this country, Papua New Guinea. Now, looking at the vote of no confidence um, that happened quite recently, um, in terms of uh, this political um, situation that happens in the country, has that sort of affected, in your opinion, the stability of, of governments and affected also the policies and service delivery. Um, your comments on that? I think we, as, as a nation, Papua New Guinea would be, uh, in terms of vote of no confidence, we have the highest number in the Commonwealth three uh, countries. Well, the vote of no confidence is, is something that really affects um, not only the government but our country. When we talk about the good governance and um, how do we sustain good, good governance, how do we implement most of these policies? So when we have different prime ministers or different governments come in within a short term, what they do is sometimes, as uh, Mr. Baka have, have pointed out, they slice and dice, chop. Most of the policies, some of these policies were good policies under the former regime. So when that happens, it sort of destabilizes Okay, the continuity of uh, this important um, uh, policy agenda, so uh, programs that was initiated. Okay? So uh, vote of no confidence is, is something that is a challenge to our democracy because it affects um, our administration go, and as far as good governance is concerned. Since this government took office, um, it's, it's talked about taking back PNG and making Papua New Guinea um, one of the richest black nation on, on, on this planet. The policies, um, have the government sort of been clear on, 
on what it uh, stands for and what it should implement. The policies are, are very broad. There's quite a bit of rhetoric, but without too much in the way of specifics. And uh, yes, politicians tend to, uh, to come out with broad statements and then, and then often ask their technical staff to put something down in, uh, in more specific terms. But it, is, it does make it difficult to actually uh, to hold the government to account when, when the policies are very, are very broad. And we do have an issue of, um, as was highlighted right, Russell there, uh, of consistency. Um, you've got the medium-term development plan, which is one of the mechanisms, which is the current one has been uh, 2018 to 2022, and they're working on preparing another one. So you have these broader policies going from the Vision 2050 through to the five-year plans, um, and then you get the votes of no confidence and changes of government, and then variations on those. So it's, at the end of the day, it's a little unclear what the policies actually are. There were some quite good uh, initiatives that came out, for example, related to uh, trying to improve governance. Um, and the governments, successive governments, have actually taken on board, for example, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, the Open Government Partnership. These are mechanisms to try and f open up uh, policies and governance mechanisms, but some of them have only gone halfway, and they've only gone they've gone rather slowly. COVID can be blamed a bit, but we should avoid blaming COVID for all our problems. Um, the Open Government Partnership, one of its key uh, components, is getting right, freedom of information or rights to information. It's already there in the Constitution, but it's to try and make government more open and accountable, and that's all the way through the system. It includes also fiscal uh, transparency and all the associated um, governance mechanisms, again, so that the public can have an idea. And you have to do this at the national level, but right down to the local level, because as highlighted earlier, a lot of the expenditure that's happening is actually at the district level, provincial level. I saw someone the other day saying, oh, my goodness, a lot of money is going to the provincial governments, but what are they actually doing? Well, these are the questions that need to be um, asked. Some of what they're doing is just what they were doing when people took on power and they just continue doing it. But if we actually accounted for the public funds that we actually have, we allocated funds in procurement and in accordance with plans and policies, and we really made good use of those funds. I think PNG would be a lot better off now and would be actually seeing a lot of uh, better goods and services being delivered. But we have a habit of, just recently we had uh, a meeting on, on the state of the economy and and um, health and education. And the education uh, officials said, well, it was wonderful to see an increase in the budget for, for uh, this was actually for health, but it was similar for education. But for health, wonderful to see an increase in the budget for health, but that it had very little to do with the national health plan. So we're doing those policies and plans. The health plan was focusing on delivering better health outcomes and therefore be better services at the district level, at the provincial level. But then in the national budget, it's all about putting in very large new hospitals and nothing for this, the medical staff, the nurses, the doctors, the pharmaceuticals, and the fit-outs that those hospitals would require. And nothing for the services at the for the training and for the services at the uh, district level that are once get more going to be starved of funds. So we need, again, to have the consistency of those policies and make sure that the actual budget allocations are consistent with the policies. It's very easy, and of course we know politicians, particularly during the periods before elections, love these grand status projects. Big buildings, big facilities. But that's not where the people are, and that's not actually necessarily the priority, and often it can be unsustainable. People want basic access roads. Four-lane roads going here, there, and everywhere are not the basic access roads. But anyway, that's just an example. All right.
good discussions and comments there. We'll take a short break now and in focus and continue with more on the other side. Good governance and policies for the next five years. You're watching In Focus. Welcome back. Our one-hour special, of course, supported by MDI, Media for Development Initiative, through the PNG Australia Partnership. Now, the final segment of the program, this one-hour special, we're heading towards the election. Final word of advice and uh, to our people. Um, it only comes once uh, every five years. Um, we're going back to the ballots now. We'll start off with you, Mr. Baka. Well, this is once every five years that the voters actually have an opportunity to make their choice. So they can do what some voters have been doing for a long time, and you accept an inducement from someone, and you just vote for him, or you accept block voting just to be done for you. Or you want to make a difference. And I'm certainly not suggesting that you uh, risk life and limb, but uh, you certainly want to ensure that you get someone who is credible, has a track record of honesty and transparency, has leadership skills, but uh, it's really important if someone has committed misdemeanors, if they have abused public office before in whatever they've been doing, are these going to be the sort of people who are going to be accountable? Are they going to be the sort of people who you would trust with your public funds? So think carefully and choose the people who are going to actually be there for the five years working for you. They're not really meant to be project managers. They're meant to be your representatives. Some may become ministers, but they're there to work for you. They're your public servants, uh, the political public servants. So choose carefully. Emily. Your final words to the voters. Yes, I will agree with um, Mr. Baka that um, the decisions we make, um, we, we have to live with them for the next uh, five years. So, again, yes, we should really um, vote wisely. And um, call out to the, especially the women voters who make, a, make up a significant um, proportion of the population. Um, we've as women, we're faced with all sorts of challenges, uh, challenges of, um, uh, of uh, gender-based um, violence, sorcery, um, unemployment, um, as, you know, as uh, mothers in the family who take care of children, and we go through the, you know, all sorts of hardships raising our children. I think um, as women, we should really seriously um, uh, think about who we, um, vote in, in these coming elections. Um, times are getting really difficult, uh, experiencing a lot of um, uncertainty in the economy. So uh, yes, um, decisions are very, very important. So. As uh, uh, Paul has pointed out earlier, when we say good leadership, what do we mean by good leadership? Our qualities. Now it's, it's important to note that in the 2017 general election, there is an indication of uh, voter protest against the PNC government. And that is something that we should uh, be mindful of and how there is a changing uh, perception, I, probably through the introduction of the social media. <laughs> but, um, well, in class, um, we tend to teach about good leadership. But what is good leadership or good qualities of a leader? Uh, well, it is important that... Um, the, like uh, Paul has pointed out, uh, leaders that fits the criteria of being a good role model in the society. And advice to our people. It's important that sometimes we take this for granted, but out in the rural areas, they need um, advice or support, some good words of encouragement from us uh, to the citizens, the masses out there, so that they make the right decisions this time around. We've spoken about good governance, governments that have come and gone, policies, uh, and some pillars of good uh, democracies that uh, we've discussed on the program. We'll take questions now uh, uh, at this later part, later part of the program, and we'll have questions from our audience. Hi, um, my name is Gabriel. 
Uh, my question is directed to Ms. Emily. Um, so, so in the lead up to the general elections, and you have mentioned um, messages or information must be communicated well. Um, what do you want to see media fraternity do in their messaging or storytelling now to the day and after the election? Also, bearing in mind the International uh, Media Freedom Day uh, team, uh, journalism under surveillance. It's a critical time for, for Papua New Guinea during the elections, as we saw in the last past elections, how uh, reporters, journalists were um, harassed in their line of duty. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, you know it, it's quite sad that um, this has hap have to happen when uh, the reporters are really out there to take um, c cover what's happening. And so on the event of, um, on the eve of uh, the uh, Media Freedom uh, Day, on celebrations towards the Media Freedom Day, I, th I think the industry, the media industry should take stock of um, um, our responsibilities towards, towards um, the people, towards the government and, um, yeah. The media, we have a very important role to play in, in the general elections. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see that uh, the journalists who are going out to cover the stories are going to be, um, you know, uh, going to, you know, to, to have the support of everybody in the, you know, in the forthcoming elections. So um, whether it's, you know, the, the policy makers or, you know, the newsroom, you know, the newsroom staff, or the, from the politicians, you know, they should know that the media is there to cover events, you know, without bias. Fair comment there yeah. from Emily. We'll have one final question from uh, members of the audience. My name is Sarah, and my question goes to the three of you. Um, how can the government continue con con consistency in its policy? Can either one of you suggest uh, practical ideas? Yes, well, it's a little bit like I was highlighting with the medium-term development plan. Um, one wants to, one doesn't want to chop and change policies uh, every time there's a, a change of government or a change of minister. Not only do we have um, frequent votes of no confidence, but we also have uh, incessant changes of ministers. So you, you really want to have consistencies of policies. You want to have the right policies, consistencies of policies. And that comes back partly to having a dialogue, to understanding what the needs are. So you, government has to be talking to the private sector. It needs to talk to citizens, both at the national and at the local level, to find out what the real needs are, not what sometimes they think the needs are. So dialogue, and that also means coordination, because one of, we now have something like 1,420 government institutions. In the early days after independence, we had a very much smaller number. I think uh, late Sir Anthony Siegaru in the late 1980s said we should stick to nine cabinet ministers, but I think now we have more like 34, and they add to the number to try and give more jobs to <laughs> for various reasons. But the problem with multiplication of institutions is that everyone is running their own shows and they're not cooperating and coordinating and consistency is essential over time, but it's also essential between the different agencies. You know, the other day I saw that, uh, the people in, some people up in... Uh, Koyari uh, area were complaining that they thought that the Kokoda track should be under TPA, not under SIPA. But in fact, of course, each institution has its own responsibilities and they all should play their part. So they actually should be coordinating. So one entity can help promote, the other one can help provide the protected area, the other can do. If you're in a rural area, you need road access or air or, sh or sea access. That is essential to actually be able to enable health services or education or police to be participating. And if you're a teacher, you want there to be health services for your own kids as well as the community. It requires operating 
outside individual boxes to actually coordinate. And that coordination needs to hap happen at the national level, including through the cabinet, through the government's uh, coordination committees, but right down to the local level, at the district level and the provincial level. All right. Interesting point is there towards the end. Uh, something I uh, got from the discussions, you know, uh, drawing a fine line between uh, politics and public administration. Uh, that's something around a topic that we're discussing, good governance and also policies for the next five years. Look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's been a pleasure having you uh, on the panel to discuss um, these important uh, um, methods on the program with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this has been in focus. If you have comments on the program uh, tonight, you can email us on the email now showing on your screen, or you can engage with us socially on our social media pages as well. If you missed tonight's program, you can catch it a little later on on our social media pages as well. This one, our special, of course, has been supported by our friends from MDI, Media Development Initiative, through the PNG Australia Partnership. From the team here, pleasant viewing.